All right. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us for our webinar. We're going to be giving updates on the historic Navahine climate settlement that we achieved um, in the state of Hawaii. Um, we will be recording today, so um, this webinar will be available for folks after we finish. Um, and before we get into all of it, make sure you introduce ourselves yourselves in the chat. Um, I'm going to be passing it off to Pohonu, who is one of our amazing youth plaintiffs, to open us up with an oli. Aloha mai kako. Pehina ia ka uvehele o no kua aloha aina. Ai no ka hua i ka maluola nipo. He leo no no e na ya oi e launa o oi no ki kama e ko na u e kali me ka ha ha u ala ba e u no e u apa u e o la e mahalo po honu okay next slide. So just to introduce myself, my name is Duration. I've been an environmental advocate. I started out as a youth activist myself um, in college and here at UH. And right now um, I'm supporting the Navahina implementation work under our Children's Trust and um, in partnership with Earth Justice, working closely with the Department of Transportation. Um, so just to talk a little bit more about what we're going to be covering today, um, we're going to be hearing from our speakers, so Andrea from our Children's Trust, Kylie from Earth Justice, Pohonu, who just did our Oli, one of our amazing youth plaintiffs, and then Laura Kaokua, who's um, leading these efforts at the Hawaii Department of Transportation. So we'll be giving kind of all of the latest updates, what's happened, what happened, how we got to this amazing settlement, and then where we're headed now in terms of how to implement the settlement for maximum success. Um, and so next slide. I want to pass it off now to Andrea and Kylie, who are just going to be giving a background about the work that Earth Justice and our Children's Trust does across the country. Wonderful. Thank you so much, DeRay, and thank you so much, everybody, for joining us to today. Um, so for those of you new to our work at Our Children's Trust, I'll just give you a brief introduction about the work that we do um, so you have a better sense of context as we talk more about the settlement agreement. So at Our Children's Trust, we engage cutting edge legal strategy backed by award winning scientists to empower young people asserting their constitutional rights to a safe and livable climate system. We want every child, young person, adult, lawyer, judge, policymaker, elected leader to understand that youth do have constitutional rights to a safe and livable, livable climate. These rights demand protection from all levels of government now really more than ever. Um, we know that our constitutions in Hawaii and places, other places around the world were designed to guarantee rights essential to exercising fundamental rights within a healthy democracy. But what we're seeing today is government policies that often promote and facilitate the use of fossil fuels, and that directly infringes upon the rights of young people. So our work really focuses on seeking protection of those rights in courts, because that's the third branch, because the third branch of government's job is to uphold our most sacred and fundamental rights. Our courts were created to interpret and declare the law and to serve as checks on the power of the other branches of government and to protect the rights of the most vulnerable and oppressed. Our Children's Trust centers children's constitutional rights in our work because that is how to create enduring solutions that can't be unwound as soon as a new administration or agency head takes place. And we have learned that if you center your efforts on protecting the rights of children, you're benefiting the entire community. Our work is inspired by social movements like suffrage, desegregation, reproductive rights, and marriage equality. Children are often at the forefront of our social movements for justice, and climate is really no different. The path to justice takes time to build, as you can imagine, um, but it really is our best shot at creating the environment for the kinds of systemic solutions 
uh, to address the biggest threat facing children today, which is climate change. We have cases in a number of different jurisdictions um, around the United States, in Canada, in other countries as well, um, all representing young people and working to ensure that youth are able to have their climate injury stories heard in courts um, and seeking remedies that actually protect their rights because they're based on science. So that's a little bit about the general work that we do in our strategic litigation campaign. And we were extremely lucky to be partnered with um, Earth Justice in this work uh, in Hawaii. And I will turn it over to Kylie to, to talk a little bit about their work. Thanks, Andrea, and mahalo to everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Kylie Wager Cruz, and I am a senior attorney with Earth Justice um, in our Mid Pacific office. Earth Justice is a public interest nonprofit environmental law firm, and we've had an office in Honolulu for over 30 years. Our office, um, our office's work is centered on three core areas. First is the protection of vi or fresh water for Native Hawaiian communities. The second main area is lands, wildlife, and oceans, where we protect endangered species and ocean, near shore ocean water quality and the like. And the third main area is climate and energy. And so um, I think a lot of folks on this call have seen that we've Earth Justice is engaged for many, many years before the Public Utilities Commission focusing on the just and equitable transition to clean and renewable energy. Um, our work on the youth climate case was our first major campaign in partnership with our Children's Trust to take on the transportation sector in particular. And I'll speak more on that later. And I'll pass it off to Andrea for the next slide. Thank you, Kylie. So how did we, how did this case really come to be? Um, you know, we have been working in, on developing this case in Hawaii for a very long time, um, meeting with youth, um, members of the community to figure out really what needs to be done to achieve the legislature's very strong decarbonization goals in the state. Uh, the case of Hawaii uh, versus Department of, of Navahine versus Department of Transportation was filed on June uh, 1st, 2022, against the state of Hawaii, um, the governor of Hawaii, and the Hawaii Department of Transportation. Um, we worked in partnership with members of the local community and again with Earth Justice. Um, Earth Justice, Kylie didn't uh, mention this, but Earth Justice is really have the leading uh, legal experts on uh, many of the constitutional rights that were invoked in the litigation. And Kylie will talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but our goal in the suit is really uh, bringing together a group of young people who are directly affected by the climate crisis and to be as representative of how young people are being impacted by climate change in Hawaii um, so that the court can have a full understanding of what it's like to be a young person growing up in climate crisis. So we had young people on um, almost all of the Hawaiian islands. Um, all of whom have experienced climate crisis in a variety of different ways. You will later hear from Pahonu to give some of his direct experiences. Um, we focused our case on the Department of Transportation operation of a transportation system because transportation emissions in Hawaii are high. And we alleged that those emissions were violating um, the youth state constitutional rights to a clean and healthful environment, as well as their public trust rights which harmed their ability to live healthful lives in Hawaii now and into the future. Our goal in the case um, was not seeking money damages. None of our cases seek money damages because there's really not enough money to uh, restore and protect the fundamental rights of young people. Um, our goal in the case was to seek a declaration that youth have constitutional rights and that their rights have been violated and that the government needs to shift course and change their programs so that they would be protective of young people's constitutional rights. I'll turn it over to Kylie to talk a little bit more about the legal foundations in the case. Great, and we can advance to the next slide, please. So as Andrea alluded to, our case centered on the Hawaii Constitution, and these are bedrock principles that have been embedded in our Constitution since 1978. The first one is the public 
Trust Doctrine, Article 11, Section 1, which mandates that the state and its political sub subdivisions protect all public natural resources for the benefit of both present and future generations. And the second provision is Article 11, Section 9, which enshrines the right to a clean and healthful environment. Um, a lot of the folks on this call, including Justice Mike Wilson, while well, he was on the Hawaii Supreme Court, and Henry Curtis and some of his biofuel cases, have all participated in, involve in evolving these um, constitutional provisions for many years, primarily in the water law context and also in the electricity sector. Um, so we were really just standing on the shoulders of these giant cases that have helped really um, solidify public rights to all natural resources and their protection for president, present and future generations um, through this case. Next slide, please. So we sought to ensure, with our, along with our youth plaintiffs, that the governor's and HDOT's success in meeting the state legislature's goal to decarbonize Hawaii's economy and achieve zero emissions in transportation by 2045. Um, and the specific statute we are focused on is HRS 225P-5. Um, a lot of folks um, would ask why transportation? Why are we focusing on transportation as opposed to other sources of greenhouse gas emissions in the state? This is the place where we thought we could create an outsized impact on climate and young people's lives and the ability to have live safe and healthy lives today and in the future. Transportation in Hawaii accounts for the majority of greenhouse gas emissions, and those emissions are projected to remain high through 2045 without changes in policy. And so without further changes, the transportation sector would be the culprit behind a full 60% of the state's emissions by 2030. Next slide, and I'll pass it to Andrea. Thanks, Kylie. So after two years of litigation, 37 depositions, the exchange of over 600,000 pieces of paper, um, the parties achieved a groundbreaking settlement agreement, um, really on the eve before trial was about to start in June of this year. The settlement agreement um, is really uh, one of a kind, and it's really the strongest remedy that has ever been achieved in a climate rights case anywhere in the world. Um, in the agreement, the parties recognized children do have a right to a clean and healthful environment that includes the right to a life-sustaining climate system. The parties acknowledged that best science should dictate climate solutions and that prioritizing the rights of children and the health of children is vital to the success of decarbonizing transportation. HDOT agreed to prepare a greenhouse gas reduction plan within one year of the agreement, which we'll probably hear a little bit more about from Laura later on. It has many different components um, that will be a part of the agreement, some, most of many of which are specified in the settlement agreement itself, um, including interim benchmarks for greenhouse gas reductions and reductions of vehicle miles traveled as well. HDOT also agreed to several institutional reforms to get the state on the path towards fully decarbonizing transportation, such as by prior prioritizing multimodal transportation options, investing in EV infrastructure, um, and as well as in transit improvements as well. HDOT will also be establishing a youth council to provide youth a seat at the table to influence and inspire the transportation policies that need to be put into place. This really is the first time that you're seeing all three branches of government working together to solve the climate crisis. The legislature has mandated zero emissions in transportation and full decarbonization of transportation. They have done that in several different statutes. The executive branch is now developing and implementing a plan to achieve those decarbonization goals and the court is there to make sure the terms of the settlement agreement are achieved. So it's really a success story of democracy in action. The agreement puts all parties to work to achieve the shared vi vision of a decarbonized transportation system. 
And it's really our hope that governments around the world will be inspired to work with youth, not against them, in securing justice. I think the agreement stands out as a beacon of hope as to what can be accomplished when um, interested parties decide to work together. Um, an interesting aspect of the agreement is that the parties asked the court to accept continuing jurisdiction over the case through 2045 or achievement of zero emissions tra in transportation, whichever happens first. We hope that it will be the decarbonization of transportation that happens first, the sooner the better. Um, in approving the agreement, the court found that the settlement was fair and in the best interests of the youth plaintiffs. And that's a unique aspect of Hawaiian law that requires the court to approve settlements that are undertaken on behalf of minors. Um, our hope is that the court will provide support in helping the executive branch meet the zero emission goals that the legislature provided. And I will turn it over now, I think, to Pahonu. Aloha mai kako. Um... Thank you so much for um, all being here. I'd like to start up with uh, mahaloing, of course, our team at both uh, Earth Justice and our Children's Trust, um, as well as now um, Hawaii Department of Transportation. Uh, you know, we're already seeing this blend of this really big ohana who is striving um, for the positive change that we all um, need. And we all know that is needed in um, achieving our goals. Um, I'd also like to shout out um, Aloha Justice Wilson, mahalo nui for being here. Um, one of our prominent um, climate warriors here in Hawaii. Um, and aloha nui to um, uh, my friends all the way in the continent, um, Ka'el Yuen, mahalo nui for being here as well. Um, so yeah, I, I like to just kind of talk about uh, why I, um, started to get involved with the case. Um, it started from a simple Zoom um, conference um, that my friend Kalalapa Winter, who is also one of the youth plaintiffs um, on this case, um, she had texted me to say, you know, jump on. Uh, we're gonna be talking about um, our work and um, how we can perhaps uh, start moving into new sectors in, in terms of advocating for the community work that we're already all involved with here in Hawaii. Um, so sorry, I'm going to mute my phone. I don't know if you guys hear that. How do you, oh, there we are. Um, so with that, I'd like to go into a little bit about uh, my work in my community, uh, Waimanalo. I come from a coastal community located on the windward side of Oahu, um, where I've been a part of the founding and the inception of uh, one of our prominent hui's here in, in Waimanalo, which is the Waimanalo Limu Hui. And uh, the goal of Waimanalo Limu Hui um, is to restore um, the once prominent resources in the Waimanalo community and specifically in our bay. Um, so that looks into providing and restoring our limu um, or our seaweed in our bay, as well as uh, restoring um, historical sites with Pahonu, my namesake, um, which is a traditional fish pond um, that once raised turtles um, for our community or for the ali'i of our community. Um, so being involved in Waimanalo Limuhui at a very young age um, has always um, inspired me to continue to advocate and protect um, for our, our environment and my community. Um, I'm also involved with um, Malama um, Aquaponics, which is uh, a program that takes in Hawaiian homestead families and teaches them about um, aquaponics. And um, they go through a multi-week program, um, learning how to build an aquaponics system, taking data, how to take care of their plants and their fishes. Um, really what we look at here in Waimanalo as a sustainable effort um, in terms of providing food for our ohanas, our families, and um, creating solutions for um, specific disparities in terms of food security um, and food sovereignty in our community. So those are two um, really um, important organizations to my heart and my, my and the reason and my passion for uh, being involved with the lawsuit. Um, you know, and it was definitely, and it is as now that we've 
had this historic settlement agreement. I look at it as a youth and a plaintiff of the case as a victory um, because we are able to now directly work with both sides of this case. Um, now we're becoming one side um, to achieve our goals um, and really allow for people like me who are rooted in our community and involved in our community very heavily to have a seat at the table. Um, so of course, this case is a reaffirming of our the importance of our voices as young people and as people who represent our communities um, that are sometimes disenfranchised. Um, one of the um, other guiding questions that I was provided is, um, you know, what does it mean now to be working in partnership with Hawaii, Hawaii Department of Transportation um, towards a, a shared um, goal? Um, I can tell you that the experience already so far has been uh, very positive and uh, very exciting. Um, I'm finding myself um, kind of in this um, trance in terms of um, when I think about um, what this settlement has been doing and will do. Um, and it is a trance that always um, seems to allow myself to think about a positive future for for my community. Um, and you know, something that was, of course, an inspiring part for me to be a part of the case. Um, and now this second portion of, you know, this long journey really um, is of course my, my family and I'm one of nine children. Um, and I have um, five younger siblings um, who are still in school, um, still in high school and in elementary. Um, so I'll be able to witness over these years the direct impacts um, and continue to see the direct impacts in terms of our younger our younger children and our younger opio of Hawaii. Um, and, you know, I think Auntie Lara is going to be sharing a little bit about the future um, in terms of some of the things that were mentioned in the implementation process of this settlement, um, which is the forming of a council you know, this council, it, it's something that is filling me with so much optimism and it's fueling um, my passion um, to continue the positive work and continue to be in my ocean, restoring the limo, restoring our historic sites, and as well as creating innovative solutions to address food security and, and all climate change. Um, so those are things that continue to inspire me, even as a young person, you know, it's very hard for young people, I think even more to feel inspired because we are in a such high stimulating world. And it's sometimes um, due to that high stimulation, it disconnects us from um, the places that really need us the most, which is our environment in this time. So that's all from me, Mahala Nui from our team. Um, I'm so excited for, um, again, for this historical settlement agreement. Aloha nui. Mahalo. Thank you, Pahonu. We're going to um, pass it off to Lara Ka'akua, who we're really, really excited to have um, under the Hawaii Department of Transportation leading the charge on the agency side for settlement implementation. So off to you, Lara. Thank you, Dore. And I'm so honored to follow Pahonu. Um, I'm absolutely inspired after hearing you, Pahonu. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, thank you to the organizers for having me. Uh, it looks like a great mix of youth and people who have been advocates for um, a healthy environment in Hawaii for a long time as well as I see some colleagues of mine from Hawaii Department of Transportation and even some um, uh, private sector folks who will be really critical for us moving forward to uh, help us meet some of these commitments. So very happy to be with you all. Um, let's see, maybe I'll go to the next slide. Uh, okay, so I'll just jump into commitments and then I'll come back. I'll do this in a little bit reverse order, come back and introduce myself and uh, the new folks that you might see at Hawaii Department of Transportation um, in the following slide. So um, 
what we're all here for, the, the settlement commitments and um, building upon uh, the historic agreement. So the settlement requires the department to establish a greenhouse gas reduction plan within one year. So that's uh, mid-May of 2025. Um, it's a short time frame, um, but we're, we're really excited to have that clarity and direction um, as an agency to then be able to switch and focus on implementation once we have that solid plan. So the greenhouse gas reduction plan um, will have many components. Uh, one of the parts of the greenhouse gas reduction plan that gets talked about a lot is establishing targets on a five-year basis. Um, something that we can measure our progress against in, in greenhouse gas reduction and in vehicle miles traveled reduction. We've committed to uh, investing 40 million in public electric vehicle charging stations and infrastructure. Um, and are making huge strides. You know, it's something um, to share with you all is the department is actually one of the leaders in the nation right now um, at uh, securing these funds for public EV charging. So we're really excited about the next push of um, these public EV charging installations that will happen on all the islands. Uh, a, a big commitment, pretty audacious. Um, is to complete the pedestrian bike and transit network within five years. So this is that you can think of it like, um, you know, our islands are like a body and the core infrastructure that connects the islands kind of the spine. And so we have gaps right now in that connecting spine. Um, and some of those gaps are, are in school districts. So, you know, kids can't safely walk. Um, to school, or maybe there are gaps in the transit network. And so our um, highways mode and um, the planning section, the planning branch has been really great in um, leading that charge to reach out to the counties and get all their GIS layers, make sure we're coordinated with all the bike and <clears throat> pedestrian plans um, to uh, get consensus about what that network is that we're actually going to be able to build out with five in five in a five year um, time frame, and in the next slide, I'll I'll share with you our uh, multimodal transportation coordinator has joined the team to add direct capacity to that settlement requirement. Um, we have a commitment to plant a thousand trees per year to sequester carbon. We know. Even with um, big, bold changes, every there's a lot of people out there um, still driving um, cars that are producing emissions, carbon emissions. And so um, we're making that commitment to support um, other groups, agencies to plant on our own at least a thousand trees per year. I think this year we expect to be beyond that 1000 tree commitment. Um, with the potential to grow that in the future uh, through partnerships. And then one of the other highlights of the settlement agreement, and there's many more um, bullets, but that would take up the, the whole hour. Uh, one of the, the last here is to create positions to oversee implementation um, and create benchmarks for greenhouse gas reduction. So that's a good transition to the next slide. So, um, Let's see, we've, I guess it's been about six months since we um, celebrated together the settlement agreement. Um, it, it feels a little bit longer than that with all the, the work that's been going on at a really uh, rapid pace. But we've brought in um, a small uh, but dedicated team and that team I think will continue to grow. So um, aloha again, everyone, I'm Laura Ka'akua. I'm the Climate Mitigation Adaptation and Culture Manager um, at Hawaii Department of Transportation. Um, I just started this year um, and am coordinating these efforts um, on our Navahine commitments. Um, when Dore introduced herself at, at the start, she shared that she herself was started as a youth advocate, and I hadn't really made the connection uh, myself, but I did as well. Um, and actually, there's maybe a lot of parallels. I was actually involved in a youth 
uh, plaintiff group, myself um, advocating for healthy Ina um, in, a, in a different situation. Um, and I've spent um, my career in service to Ina in some way or form through land protection or service within um, government. And so I'm very happy to be at HDOT, still pursuing that same uh, mission of um, having people come together to care for Ina, um, just in a different capacity here. Um, Genevieve Sullivan is climate resiliency manager. Jen is a planner uh, by training um, as, and has done some amazing work already within the department. Um, she led the effort to develop the Highways Climate Adaptation Action Plan, um, which really moved us forward in terms of understanding uh, within our highway system, which sections were most at risk and what are the, adap uh, the adaptation um, and resilient strategies that we needed to take to protect not only the highway infrastructure, but most importantly, the communities that um, are aside them. Um, Natasha Soriano is our multimodal transportation coordinator out of, she'll be helping um, where she can, but her, her main focus is really that pedestrian bike and transit network development within five years in partnership with the counties. She's based on Hawaii Island um, and has worked at the department before as well as uh, Hawaii County as a planner. So we're, we're very happy to have her on and her background is in engineering as well. Um, she's been an advocate for safe routes to school and multimodal projects for a long time. Um, Jackie Chong is on and she may actually be on this call. Jackie has a background in finance and is really providing all that administrative and operating support to our office. So um, that's our team, but of course not shown here is um, our leadership at the department and folks in every branch. It's really gonna take our whole department coming together to make these um, policy and process changes uh, that are required in the agreement. Next slide. Okay, I think this is me as well. <laughs> the um, Youth Advisory Council, we're so excited. Um, great timing, our application is now open and our website is now available for you to look at. So the QR code is there. Um, and I wanna thank um, Earth Justice and our Children's Trust for their partnership in, and their second sets of eyes in um, helping us to stand up our, our website and our application. Um, we're just so excited to have um, a true partner in the Youth Council as we move forward on all of these changes. Um, there'll be a sounding board, a, a thought leader. Um, it's going to be a true reciprocal relationship. So we'll be doing a lot of education um, for this council and then welcoming them to, to sit with us and, and give their input. So we're looking forward to that. Applications are open for a month um, until November 25th. And then it's a quick turnaround because um, it's important um, especially to our director that we, we end the year um, making sure that our council has come together for that first uh, meeting to set a good foundation for the upcoming year. Next slide. Thank you, Laura. I see some questions coming in and we'll get to that in just a, in just a minute. I'm gonna have Andrea and Kylie just share any final thoughts on the settlement and next steps. Thanks, Deray. Um, I really just want to acknowledge and mahalo HDOT for taking this huge and monumental step of reaching settlement with us. Um, in developing the settlement, we really leaned on best practices across the nation for decarbonized, decarbonizing transportation. But the, some of this is uncharted territory. We're really leading the nation in, effort, in efforts to decarbonize an entire transportation sector. Um, HDOT has really embraced change and they've woven into their, they've woven um, climate change mitigation across all areas of HDOT, highways, harbors, and airports. 
Um, and by settling this case, we are able to just move straight toward implementation. We really only have 20 more years to get this right and avoid the complete disaster of the climate crisis. Um, and we're really looking forward to working with HDOT in the future. And I also wanted to acknowledge that many folks on this call and outside of this call have been engaged in the transportation space for many, many years. Um, and there will be opportunities for the public to be involved in implementing the settlement going forward. Um, one of the key um, areas for public input will be on the greenhouse gas reduction plan that's due in the spring of next year. And so um, join our mailing list, stay updated so that you can have the opportunity to pro provide input in that process. Thank you. And yeah, Andrea? Yeah, thanks, Kylie. That's that's really right. I mean, really, the real work starts now. Um, and I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of different opportunities and, and particularly on on individual projects, because that's what's going to be driving the change is, you know, this is going to be happening in specific communities in neighborhoods. And so um, education and connections and inspiring communities to understand why these transportation projects are happening, because, as you know, transportation projects can be hard. Um, they can create inconvenience when you're adding a new bike lane. And so it's going to be really important that the community understands why is there a bike lane going into this area and why do we need to support this work? Um, so there'll be many opportunities in the coming years, particularly these next five years are vitally important as they start um, completing the pedestrian and the bike networks. That's an integral part to achieving decarbonization of transportation and HDAT has set very aggressive goals for that and they can really only be achieved with the support um, and the force of the community behind them. So we really encourage you to stand with the youth um, and work with HDOT and making sure that all of those timelines and deadlines are achieved um, as quickly as possible because we really can't achieve climate justice without decarbonizing all of our systems, including transportation, as quickly as we possibly can. So thank you for all your support of this case and for our young plaintiffs as they continue to lead the efforts towards climate justice. Thank you for joining us and we're looking forward to answering many of your questions. Thank you, Kylie and Andrea. We can go to the next slide. So we're gonna go into q and A. <clears throat> I'm seeing the questions come in, so please just continue to add them into the chat. Um, there's a, a couple questions here on tree planting. So this is, would be for you, Laura. So um, at, the question here is, is there potential to plant some of the trees in the pedestrian bike transit zone? And then another of uh, which communities will be targeted for tree planting? and how that's determined. And if I can just add one more tree planting question is, cause I think Chip Fletcher talks a lot about, um, or yeah, I can't remember, I think it's Chip Fletcher, but one of the experts in this area talks about how a big issue is that it's hard to keep trees alive for lo a long period of time. So kind of a question on the longevity plan to make sure that the tree planting efforts are successful long-term. So if you can go into that whole tree planting section, that'd be awesome, Laura. Sure, and feel free to, re-ask a question if I don't get to everything. Um, I can share that this year, because we have so much to do so quickly, we are fulfilling, we're primarily fulfilling our thousand tree commitment by um, buying trees for a uh, division of forestry and wildlife on you know each island um, and supporting their efforts. So definite carbon sequestration but not as much focus in the actual, um, along the transportation corridor. So um, yes, there's absolutely room to do planting along the corridors. We're, we've um, partnered with a, a national nonprofit to do a study of our right-of-ways that just started and is underway to look at um, the feasibility of um, you know, what we can sustain in those right of ways long term, even looking at solar, mini solar installations in some of the right of ways where, you know, maybe it's a really hot, dry area where um, it may not be worth the um, intense irrigation that may be needed, or even a third option would be doing solar with um, 
ground cover, native ground cover. Um, so making it a carbon sink, but also a clean energy producer. So that has started. And um, we realized that especially when we're making efforts to build multimodal paths, we want to make sure that those uh, paths are then used. And we understand shade is a way to to do that, to promote use of those paths and that alternative transportation. So we haven't gotten there yet, um, but as we push forward these multimodal projects in particular, um, that will be an uh, important component. And you think you, you may have one, oh, how do we give leap, keep, um, the trees alive? Um, that is a big thing where we, I know of at least a few myself of, um, large planting efforts, sometimes done at the direct request of community, but because there wasn't, um, you know, infrastructure in place or because um, trees were planted and um, there was no rain that year, right? Um, there's like large planting sections that didn't make it. Um, so I don't have an answer there yet, but, um, I, I guess it's just acknowledgement of the problem. You can, you can, you know, there's some great, especially I'm thinking about like the east side of Oahu, right? Along the transportation corridor, you can plant hala, you can plant kukui and know it's going to do very well. And then in our central or, or um, leeward sides of our islands, uh, not so much. And we need to either um, take that additional step of infrastructure. And then we have to consider like, you know, the water usage and whether it's worth it, whether we can have reclaimed water or whether we can partner with a community organization. So I think, I expect we'll be doing um, many more community partnerships in particular to help us with uh, stewardship of um, planted areas. Thanks, Laura. Um, John? Thanks, Dre. And mahalo, Laura. I'm super excited for all the tree planting. Um, I think maybe my question might have gotten lost in the in the tree talk. Um, but yeah, just sort of wondering if there's like any framework um, that's been developed so far to kind of determine like which communities will benefit from the tree planting. Maybe that's not something you guys have been able to suss out yet, but just kind of curious if it's Kind of yeah, no, we haven't identified way. particular communities. I think so far um, it's been conversations at a island by island level between um, HDOT and uh, Division of Forestry and Wildlife on that particular island and sort of um, just addressing their immediate needs because, um, you know, as of now, that's really the state agency with the expertise in um, native plantings in particular. And so um, no, we, yeah, we don't have like a, a framework, but ideally it would be more so, or I would say less so, um, target communities that we're doing a lot of planting in and more so, uh, um, framework of how we're regularly incorporating that statewide. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Let's move into some of these other questions. Um, so this one is about the status of the clean ground transportation working group and who the members are. Is that a question for you, Laura, or should we get some clarification on this one? Sorry, can you repeat the name of the, sorry, I didn't hear the full clean, question. Clean ground transportation working group. Oh, okay. Um, I don't have that, that list up now. Um, that is a um, committee that HDOT and the, the um, State Energy Office um, are leading. And I do know that um, we are planning to go to that group with um, sections of our greenhouse gas reduction plan um, in the coming months to get, to get their feedback. But uh, yeah, that's all I can shared right off the bat, just because I don't have that list in front of me. Okay, great. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Sherry's question is, do you anticipate issues obtaining funding necessary to achieve the decarbonization plans? So all these questions are for you, Laura. <laughs> yeah, <I've, laughs> that's okay. Um, 
Yes, I think funding is absolutely a challenge, right? We, there's a big settlement agreement. It didn't come with the equally big pot of money dedicated to these efforts. Um, and that's why, you know, there's a, a requirement on the department to be out there requesting, right? The focus is um, primarily on requesting these funds. So um, we have made um, big strides already in requesting federal funds towards these efforts. I gave the example earlier of the um, public electric vehicle charging stations. Um, I think the, the overview was great that you know all branches of our government were involved in this and the same will be true on the back end to implement. We absolutely will need um, state legislative support as well as county support in each county to fund the bike, ped and transit network connections. Um, so I, I would say, yes, it is a challenge and um, it will need um, both HDOT making those requests to the federal and, and state um, legislators and funding programs. And then it will need advocacy from everyone on the call and um, support from our sister agencies as well. Yeah, and DeRay, I would just like to add with that, I think that also to emphasize the power and the importance in Hawaii, there is a right to a life sustaining climate system. So that's a constitutional imperative and that should be guiding um, the legislative and the executive priorities. That's certainly what how HDOT is viewing things with the settlement agreement. And when the governor announced the settlement agreement, he said one of the things he was so pleased about is he can take the settlement agreement to the legislature and say, look, we're not just asking to do this because we think it's a good idea. It's constitutionally required and it's what's needed to protect the constitutional rights of our young people. So that adds another impetus for the legislature to fully fund whatever they need to make sure that um, the implementing the, the settlement agreement is successful. And again, I'll echo what Laura said, this is a place where we all need to be making sure legislators understand the imperative of fully funding what needs to be done to achieve decarbonization. Thanks for adding that, Andrea. I just wanted to ask too, because I remember when I met with your team, Andrea, a few months ago, um, that Matt was like very emphatically saying that this was the best possible outcome. So I, was, I wanted you to share with everybody here why this settlement was the best possible outcome and what would have happened alternatively if we went to trial. Yeah, I think the reason this is the best possible outcome is because you have all three branches working together toward the same goal. Um, I think if we were to go to trial and even if the youth were to win, the court can declare what the law says, um, what the law requires, but the courts would never go into the kind of specificity that is in the settlement agreement. And in achieving the settlement agreement, the parties were able to put their heads together and come up with solutions that work in terms of protecting the rights of young people. So it was the young people's goal to achieve decarbonization. They had experts that said, here are a variety of ways um, that we believe are technically and economically feasible to implement. HDOT came to the table and said, here's our constraints, here's our ideas, and the parties work together to achieve a plan that the court can then make sure um, is enforced going forward. So there's no other way that you can achieve that kind of specific result. And as Kylie said, you know, we really jumped straight to the implementation stage instead of fighting over, you know, what who what was H dot doing wrong? You know, what are we able to prove? Um, we weren't required to do that in a court of law because H dot and, and the leadership of Ed Sniffen really stepped up and said, I see that there's a problem here. Let's just fix it instead of fighting about it. Awesome. Kylie, do you have anything to add there? No, I was interested in this question about the multimodal network in the chat. Okay, awesome. So Abby's asking, how is multimodal network defined within the agreement? And what do you anticipate being the largest barriers to completing it within the five years? Laura. <laughs> uh, I'm just laughing. I was wondering if that was for me. Um, so in the, our agreement, there's not um, 
there's not much specificity about exactly what the multi, what the network is, right? And so that was what we were left with, right? We wanted, I think we all understood that we wanted a central um, pedestrian bike and transit system for each island that would connect communities, right? Um, and but you know exactly what that is. There wasn't a plan that went along with our settlement agreement. So we're um, having to move with a lot of urgency because we have to actually build it in five years. And so we're doing kind of a truncated plan where we're um, not worrying about the narrative. We all understand what is needed. We're just overlaying, um, getting GIS data from each county they already have their priorities or, you know, their um, sections, some of which they've, they've filled and we can show progress on it, some of which have been gaps in the system for a long time and um, on our state highway system as well. Um, and so we're, this month we're, we're um, kind of just compiling, overlaying all of those layers. And then once we have the full network, which will include really everything, right? Um, county, state, um, then we have to decide if we are requesting these audacious sums of money, if we're working in partnership, if we're doing everything that we can, what is the, the core network that we have to build out in five years? Um, we know we're not gonna be able to build out every possible you know, multi-use um, trail uh, on every island um, on the county side, uh, but what's that core network then that then other um, trails and bike lanes can can connect to after year five. So um, it's a it's mainly needs coordination with the counties. Um, we will I know there's MPO folks on here. Uh, we'll have to expand that circle once we have the core priorities from the counties as well. Um, and then the biggest, um, I think there's a, there's a few roadblocks, but possible roadblocks, which would be um, kind of just the, the, the timing of the funding, you know, and then um, making sure that we're getting through compliance and for federal funding in particular, trying to move as quickly as we can through compliance to actually deliver the projects um, in both the timeframe required under the agreement, as well as the federal funding timelines. Um, so that's, that's one, making sure we have state funding support for projects um, and making sure that we have um, really clear and very frequent communication with the counties and all of the um, stakeholder organizations, the MPOs, um, the stakeholder organizations, and with our federal agency uh, counterparts so that we continue all working towards the same goal. But everyone's been really supportive um, and excited thus far. So, so we're very um, enthused. We just have a few minutes left, so I'm going to try to get through some of the faster questions. So, um, Laura, can you share with everyone the age, the range for the Youth Council? Yeah, it's 11 to 24 years old. So we just kind of um, made it as expansive as we thought, um, as we could, really, looking at other Youth Councils around the nation and even internationally. And Asia from EPA is asking if, if any of this is reflected in the upcoming STIP for 2025, do we know that? So the STIP per, I guess I'll just go back to our settlement requirements. The STIP um, before the next planning cycle uh, has to be revised to include um, the new prioritization. Got it. Um, Brian's asking if we have sufficient local labor force for the construction goals of the settlement or is there an anticipated need for contractors? Do we have thoughts on that? Uh, workforce, of, well, I'll, I'll go first and maybe people wanna, wanna chime in. Um, I, I know that on the workforce development side, um, there is a big need um, and I actually know UH is working on um, training within this 
you know, clean energy, um, clean transportation sector, and applying for grant funds along those lines to support the development of this new sector that we need, new workforce sector that we need. So I guess I would say we probably don't have, uh, we don't have any, everyone that we need currently. Um, you know, we need uh, bus, more bus drivers, we need mechanics, we need uh, solar installers, we need, a, there's a whole range of folks, um, you know, we need our, our local engineers to stay home and come work for HDOT. So um, yeah, it'll take that partnership with our um, educational sister agencies as well. Great. Kylie and Andrea, anything to add on any of those? Point. Yeah, one of the things that we're really excited about in partnership, we're working with um, HDOT in terms of education and engagement campaigns surrounding the entire settlement agreement. So I think that's the kind of um, question that will be important to um, work with the community on and where is their community interest in that kind of work and how do we how do we support that through other channels as well? So that's an aspect of the settlement agreement. I don't think we we touched on yet, but um, we're really excited to be building that um, education surrounding the, the settlement agreement as we move forward. The last question that we can get to is from Sherry is if HDOT will consider offering free public transportation um, for to get people out of their cars? So, yeah, this is an interesting one. I mean, the the transit um, systems are on the county networks, although we, we do play a really important connecting role. Um, I do know that there's some states that have um, started, you know, free transportation programs for sections of their community um, that Somehow they've figured out the funding component um, to incentivize the counties to do that through partnership with the state DOT and the legislature. Uh, so I think we um, we aren't prepared to put, to provide free transportation to everyone, but I think um, it's something that that's definitely on our minds on looking at um, other states' examples of how they've been able to expand their public transit system with some um, incentivized incentive, incentives or um, uh, subsidies almost from the state DOT and the state legislature. Got I'll it. just add related to mass transit, one, um, one initiative that our plaintiffs are really excited about is um, getting tourists off of roads and or off of out of cars and into buses. Um, there was one example that came up in the lawsuit, the Hanalei initiative on the North shore of Kauai, where people have to take um, a bus, tourists have to take a bus in order to go for, in a certain corridor on the North shore. Um, many of our plaintiffs live in remote areas where there's extremely high tourist traffic, but not a lot of residents and the residents have trouble accessing um, their homes and getting in and out of town. And so, we're hoping that um, through the Youth Council and our continued work in these areas with HDOT that we can build upon those types of initiatives. Thanks, Kylie. Uh, we can go to our last slide now. We are at the hour. So just closing up, we just wanted to thank you all for joining us. This QR code also goes to this link, which will allow you to um, sign up on our internal list and we'll be sending you updates as they come and opportunities to chime in on the greenhouse gas emissions plans, reduction plans, um, et cetera. And we're kind of in a process of stakeholder engagement. So if you wanna make sure that you're included, um, feel free to email either Emily or Marty and we'll be sending you all a recap as well um, from the webinar. So thank you everyone for joining us today.